Good morning and welcome to our worship service. Today is July 25th and we are glad that you are here with us today. We're celebrating Appalachia Service Project Sunday. This is the day where we have uh, different emphases on the Appalachia Service Project, which we just had a team of 18 people go from Trinity Church down to Greenbrier County, West Virginia to help make homes warmer, safer, and drier. And today I'm going to be sharing a message from Ephesians chapter 4 about serving Jesus even when you don't quite want to. So tune in this week and learn about how Jesus can use us in the most unlikely places.
A few announcements as we begin. First of all, our nursery is open. So if you are a young family and have young children and have been wondering about whether you can bring them back to church or not in person, you can. We have our nursery open at our 9.30 service and at our 11 o'clock service, and we invite you to join us for worship. Also, we have our Vacation Bible School coming up August 2nd through the 6th, our church picnic on August 15th, and our Rise Against Hunger meal packing event on Sunday, August 22nd at 2 o'clock. We're going to have two different shifts, one at 2 o'clock and one at 3 o'clock. We're going to need 50 people at each of those, and I encourage you to sign up for that. It's an event that you will not forget. We're going to package 20,000 meals to go overseas and feed the hungry, as well as not only feed them physically, but also nurture their, nurture their spiritual needs as well. Join us for that on August 22nd. At this time, let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for this place that we have to worship you. And Lord, whether it's here in church or whether it's home, watching online, we believe that your presence is here. And we invite your presence to wherever we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, boys and girls. This is Pastor Jeff. And for our children's message today, I want to show you this really neat thing that I got together. I take these different nails, and you can see these are about 12 inches long. They're solid steel. And I, I always ask, how impressive would it be if I could take another nail and balance it on the head of this nail? Would that be pretty cool? Not bad, right? But you're not very impressed, I can tell already. All right, so one nail, anybody could do one nail, right? What if I could do two nails? Or what if I could even do three nails? You know how many nails I have here? I actually have six nails, three and three. What if I could balance all six of these nails on the head of this one nail all at the same time? Wouldn't that be neat, boys and girls? Let's give it a shot. I'm going to show you how this works, all right? If I arrange the nails in this fashion, watch carefully. Are you ready? <laughs> Just dropped one. Ready? I promise you I'll get this. I've done it before. There we go. Look at that, boys and girls. Six nails. Balanced. All at the same time, on the head of one single nail. Isn't that amazing? Now, you know what I love about this is it's just kind of neat to see. People don't think you can do this, and then you show them how it works. When you align the nails in this way, it all balances out. And this teaches us something about two very important principles. Number one is the principle of balance. All right, balance. If I were to move this one way or the other, the whole thing would fall over. But by balancing it right at the right spot, it all works out. It all balances and stays put. And we need to find balance in our lives between our mental, our physical, and our spiritual selves. And one of the ways we find balance in spirit is by coming to church, by spending time in prayer, by reading the Bible. And I encourage you to continue to do that. Find balance in your life. But here's the other thing. This doesn't just show us about balance, but it also shows us the importance of every part doing its job. This whole, every single one of these nails is needed in order for this to work. If I were to take out one nail, even one, the whole thing would fall apart. And that's a picture of the body of Christ, like we looked at in Ephesians. Every part works together to do its work, and together we're able to do things that none of us could ever do alone, on our own. And so, boys and girls, we want you to come to church, because if you're missing from church, it'd be like if I pulled one of these things out, it just it wouldn't work right. And we believe that your presence here in church is an important thing. We want you to know that God loves you. We want you to know that we love you. And we want you to know that you make a difference here as a part of Train of the United Methodist Church. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you show us balance and that you show us the importance of each and every one of us in your ministry, in your family, in your kingdom here at Train of the United Methodist Church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please follow along with the words on the screen and sing along as we lift up our praises to the Lord.
with his spirit and his love. Let him fill your heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, let him have the things that hold you, and his spirit like a dove will descend upon your life and make you For our pastoral prayer time, if you have a praise or a prayer request that you would like to share, as long as it's not something confidential, I invite you to enter it into the chat. Let us know how we can pray for you. At this time, let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we come to you today and we ask that you would clear away the clutter in our minds, sweep away the spaces in our hearts, and help us to find space for you in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts, in every essence of our being. Lord, we need you, we need more of you. And we pray that we would align our lives in such a way that we make time and space for you. As we gather together this morning to do just that, Lord, we pray that you would open up our minds, open up our hearts to receive from you, and open up our lives to give in response. Lord, we pray that you would work in, among, and through us today, in your community, in your church, outside of your church, outside of these walls, in the world around us. May we show the love of Christ in very powerful ways. And may we, as your church, share the gospel with those who need to hear it, even as we live it out in our own lives, each and every day. All of this we pray, as you taught us to pray by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please open your Bibles and follow along as we read from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16 to hear what Paul had to say about the different gifts and graces that God has given to each and every one of us, about how we all work together to accomplish God's purposes. When we work together as one, we build what God is trying to build following the example and the leadership of Jesus Christ. The scripture today is from Ephesians chapter 4, Verses 7 through 16. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, 
he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. Speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the reading of your word, and we pray that you would help us to apply it to our lives each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I want to share with you a story that I've shared at this church before because it happened in this church. And that relates to the hammer and nail that you see on the screen there because it involves a mission trip. When I came here in 2016, I had never gone on a mission trip. 45 years old at the time, had been serving in the church for almost 20 years as a pastor, had been serving in the church my whole life in a variety of different ways, never went on a mission trip. Well, why not? Because I'm not so good with tools. I'm more likely to hit my thumb than I am to hit a nail if I pick up a hammer. And I always thought I'm going to be useless on a mission trip, so why go? But when I came to this church, I realized that we have this ministry at Trinity called the Appalachia Service Project and that it has been in existence since I think 1970, 1971 at Trinity. It's been in existence even longer than that in Appalachia. But Trinity has been involved for over 50 years. And we haven't gone consecutively every year, but for 30 plus years on and off, we have sent a team to the Appalachia Service Project in order to make homes warmer, safer, and drier for the people of Appalachia and to show the love of Christ in powerful and practical ways as we serve in the name of Jesus. And so hearing about that and hearing they took youth along, I decided I had better go even if I didn't want to. And I really kind of kept it a secret from everyone that I didn't want to go because I didn't want to put a, a, a I didn't want to put a bad light on everybody else who was going, but mission trips just weren't my thing, or so I thought. So I went very reluctantly. But I have to tell you, I had a great time. And we helped to build a deck for people, or a back porch and steps, and you know, I was using saws and hammers and nails and all this stuff. And I found that under the proper guidance, I was able to actually accomplish these things. And by the end of the week, we had built a very nice porch and a nice set of stairs for a person and for their family. It was amazing how it all came together. But the ironic thing, as I said, is God used me even though I didn't want to go. And I wonder, has God ever used you in a way when you didn't realize it? Have you ever struggled to know where you fit into God's plan? To struggle to know where you fit into God's church? Maybe Trinity Church. Maybe you've been watching us online and you haven't come in person because you're not sure if you'll have a place here. You're not sure if people are going to accept you here. I want you to know that we would welcome you. I want you to know that you would find a place here and that we've all felt like a square peg trying to fit into a round hole at different times in our lives. But the grace of God and the grace of Jesus is that God shows us a way. God has a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us, even someone like me who can't build much. God was able to use me 
in very powerful ways on that trip. And I try to go back every year that I'm able to go and to contribute in whatever way that I can. And I believe that God can use all of us in different ways. And I want to share with us today three lessons from Ephesians about serving in God's kingdom. And the first lesson comes with this story. I remember growing up in the church. My father was a pastor, and I can remember having this idealized view of church, thinking that everyone got along perfectly, thinking that everyone had the same type of faith, had the same understandings of the Bible, the same understandings of Jesus, that everyone, when the choir got up to sing, they all sang with one voice, and when the trustees worked on a project to serve, they all served together uh, with, with one mind and one spirit and one heart, and all the stuff that you read about in the Bible, that some of it we looked at last week even, and talked about unity. And, and I, I kind of thought that's the way the church is, or at least that's the way the church should be. But you know what I discovered is that it's kind of like in The Wizard of Oz when Dorothy goes expecting the wonderful, wonderful Wizard of Oz and how great he's going to be, but then she peels back the curtain and finds that he's just a normal, everyday human being like everyone else, and he doesn't have special powers. Uh, he, he just is a, a regular person. And you know, we kind of feel, or I kind of found that that's the same way it is in the church, that we're, we're all just regular people trying to do God's will, trying to serve in the best way that we can, but, but we're not all on the same page. And there's times where we disagree. There's times where we argue. There's times where we have different beliefs and, and different theological understandings and different interpretations of Scripture. And, and yet we're called to this idea of unity, and, and we struggle with that. It doesn't always exist at least not in the way that we think about it. It doesn't mean that we all think alike and act alike and live alike in all of the same ways, but we are still God's church and we still are called to unity. And so here's the teaching that I want you to bring to light from Ecclesiastes. It's this, unity does not mean uniformity. And I think that's apparent in the text. I want to look a little bit at what we studied last week, which was from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6, and then follow that up with verse 7, which is what we're looking at today, to explain this concept that I'm trying to get at here today, the idea that unity does not mean uniformity. Verse 3 says this, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's that word unity. And Paul says, make every effort to keep it. I think we should. I believe it's important. Unity is important. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. One, one, one. Unity. But unity is not to be confused with uniformity. Uniformity is this idea that we're all wearing the same uniform, that we all move at the same time, that we all think the same way, that we all speak the same way. All of this uniformity, it's not the same as unity because look at the next verse. Look at what verse 7 says. Paul says, but. Paul says all of this, one, one, one. Unity, unity, unity. But. Listen to what he has to say next. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Grace has been given as Christ apportioned it to each and every single one of us, and the idea is that it's different. Christ apportions it differently to each and every one of us. So somebody else might be very good at building things with their hands. I'm not. But I might be able to preach a sermon or teach a Bible lesson that someone else might not be able to do so well. We all have different gifts. We are all to use them for God's service and for God's glory, but we do it in different ways. And you know what? We have Republicans in this church. We have Democrats in this church. We have liberals in this church. We have conservatives in this church, people that are in the center, all kinds of different thoughts and ideologies and theologies. And that's okay. We are still united in our love for Christ. We are still united in wanting to serve Jesus and in wanting to do that together. But unity does not mean uniformity. And my friends, that's okay. Jesus, or Paul talks about it here using Jesus as an example of that unity, but each one of us has been given different gifts and we should use them in different ways. It's not the same as uniformity. That's one lesson that I hope you'll take home with you today. A second lesson comes with this story of John Wesley known as the Aldersgate Experience. 
and we know when it happened. It was on May 24th, 1738. John Wesley was going to a Bible study. And the scriptures, or not the scriptures, the, the journal, John Wesley's journal tells us that he went very unwillingly to this Bible study. He did not want to go. But he went anyway, and while he was there, something happened. When he went to where he didn't want to go, God showed up. And John Wesley describes it in this way. He says, I felt my heart strangely warmed. And I knew that Christ had died for my sins, that Christ had forgiven me, even me. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but the idea that Wesley had was that it wasn't his works that saved him. It was the grace of God through Jesus. John Wesley knew all about works. He had tried, kind of like the Apostle Paul, to do everything right and to follow every code and every letter of the law. That's why they called him a Methodist, because he was so methodical in the way that he did things. John Wesley knew about works-oriented righteousness, but what he hadn't yet understood was grace. And he understood that grace when he went very unwillingly to that meeting that day and experienced an encounter with God. And here's the point that I want you to take home with that idea from John Wesley. Serving where we're called is more important than serving where we're inclined. If John Wesley had just done what he wanted to do, what he was inclined to do, he would have stayed home that night. And had he stayed home that night, he would have missed the blessing that changed the course of his life, of his ministry, and of the church that we love and serve today, the United Methodist Church. What if Wesley had just stayed home? What if he had done what he was inclined to do rather than what he was called to do? Are there times where you're more comfortable just doing whatever you feel like, doing what you feel inclined to do, and you know that God has called you to more. You know that call, God has called you to greater things, but they make you uncomfortable. They take you outside of your comfort zone. That means sharing the gospel with someone. That means serving someone. That means taking a risk, and you're not really inclined to do that. Let me ask you this. What opportunities are you missing because you're doing what you're inclined to do, not what you're called to do? And what opportunities could God introduce into your life if you would do what you're called to do instead of what you feel inclined to do? Folks, this is the message. Serving where we're called is more important than serving where we're inclined. Ephesians talks about that in this chapter, uh, in, in verse 4, or uh, in chapter 4, verse 12, verse 11 and 12, they give these gifts. Jesus gives gifts to different people. God calls them to things. It says, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Why? To prepare God's people for works of service. Not because they were inclined in a certain way, but because they were called to it. What are you called to do by God? And are you willing to step outside of your comfort zone in order to do that? Three lessons from Ephesians that I want us to go over here today. The first, unity does not mean uniformity. The second, serving where we're called is more important than serving where we're inclined. And the third one, I want to show you this picture. Uh, maybe you've seen this picture before or a video like it. It's a football team that goes out and shovels people's driveways. And it's amazing to watch the video. If you go and Google this or watch it on YouTube, it's amazing how quickly it happens. I mean, they are united in their purpose. And there's a bunch of guys and they come together and they all take a section and they knock out these driveways full of snow in a matter of minutes. And if any one of them tried to do it on their own, it would probably take them hours. And, and yet when they all work together like that, they're all able to accomplish this task in a matter of mere moments. It's an amazing thing to watch. And it happens as they work together. And that brings us to the third point, folks. Working as one is better than working alone. When they work as one, they are all motivated to clear that driveway. And it's almost like synchronous swimming when they do that, the way that they do uh, that work together. Because they're working as one. They have a common goal. They have a common purpose. But they've each got their own shovel. And they've each got their own section that they're supposed to work on and they all do it, and as they each individually do their part, the job gets done. Listen to what the scriptures say. It sounds a lot like that, doesn't it? 
Then we would no longer be infants, tossed about back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, listen to this, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. As each part does its work, you have been given a calling from God. Your life has a purpose from Jesus. Are you living to fulfill that calling? You know, my first church was uh, Osceola United Methodist Charge. There were three churches, Osceola, Lemert, and Plankton just outside of Bucyrus, Ohio, when I was a seminary student at Ashland Theological Seminary. And I served those churches for two years, and they didn't have much of a budget, and they didn't give me my business card. I had to go print my own business card. And I remember I could, if I was printing my own card, I could put whatever I wanted to on it. And so I, I put, you know, Jeff Vanderhoff, pastor of those three churches. And then I chose a scripture verse to put on the card. And the scripture verse that I chose was the one that I just read to you a few moments ago. It was he who called some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be apostles or pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. I chose that verse because I wanted a reminder that I'm not in this alone that I can't do this alone, as tempting as it is, and haven't we all been there? We're also so tempted to just say, you know what, if I'm going to get this job done, I'll be better off doing it myself, because nobody else is going to do it the same way I could or would. They're not going to do it right. But you know what, folks, in ministry and really in life, it doesn't work that way. If we want to optimize our lives, we have got to learn to work with other people, people who are not uniform with us, but people who are united in purpose, in vision, and in Christ. And as we learn to work together with those people, we do our part, they do their part, and more gets done. More gets done. There is no room for a lone ranger in ministry. I need you, and we need each other. We are called together to serve, and we serve better when we serve together. Here at Trinity Church, it's amazing the things that we do. We have ministry to the homeless. We have ministry to people who are hungry. We have ministry to people who need food here in our own community and in our own county. And through Rise Against Hunger, we'll feed 20,000 people somewhere across the sea in a place where m most of us will never go. We have ministries that reach out to children in Haiti and to others in, in that island nation. We have ministries that reach out to people in our own community as well as in communities all across the world. We proclaim the love of Christ to people. We serve children. We serve families. We serve older adults. We serve men and women. We serve so many different people in so many different ways. We have our Appalachia Service Project that goes year after year after year to West Virginia or Kentucky or somewhere far from here and yet close to our hearts as we seek to serve others in the name of Jesus. And when we send a team down, like we did this past couple of weeks ago with 18 people, imagine if only one person decided to go. If one person said, you know what, I could do this better than everybody else. I'm good with tools. I'm just going to go do this. They wouldn't have gotten hardly anything done. But with a team of 18 people, some with different gifts, some with different abilities, they were able to accomplish so much more working together. Here at Trinity Church, we are able to accomplish so much more working together than we ever could on our own. Working as one is better than working alone. And when we work together in the name of Jesus, we serve others and we serve God, all under the power of Jesus' name. Let's serve together as one, never alone. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the message that you've given us today. Lord, for this teaching from Ephesians. Lord, may we build each other up. May we do our part in serving the body of Christ so that together we might accomplish more than any one of us ever could on our own. May we follow the way of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. 
For our ministry moment and our time of offering today, I want to share with you just some of the wonderful feedback that I am blessed to get through letters and cards that people send to me about our online ministry. And if you're watching this right now, maybe you're one of the people who have sent one of those cards. Uh, maybe you're one of the people who have been blessed by our online ministry and you haven't sent a card, but you're feeling blessed nonetheless. I want to encourage you to go ahead and send the card. Drop us a note. Let us know that you're being impacted by this. Let us know where you're tuning in from and, and how it's impacting your life. We'd love to hear from you. I get notes often from people who tune in from California, from Florida, from Mississippi, uh, from right here in Cannonsburg or Pittsburgh area. And they just share, hey, how, I just want to let you know how much we love your online service. We're so blessed that you do this and that we're able to attend church uh, online. Now, we'd love to have you here in person. I hope that you know that. But I know that for some, online is a, a better way for you to worship because you're off at a distance or you have something that prevents you from coming in person. And, and if that's the case for you, I want you to know that we're blessed to have you worship with us online. We'd love to meet you in person someday. But if, if online is what works for you, let us know that. Let us know how we're helping. And, and to all of us, let us just be, real, be aware that God uses a variety of different ways to reach a variety of different people. And we are blessed at Trinity to have in-person worship, to have online worship, and to spread the gospel in as many ways to as many people as we can. And your gifts help to make that possible. So if you'd like to make an offering or donation to our church, you can do that online through our websites, or you can send in a check or drop something off at the office or come in on a Sunday morning. We'd love to meet you. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the work that you do through online ministry, through in-person ministry, through a variety of different ways, a variety of different methods. And Lord, we pray that all of it would be for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Please follow along with the words on the screen and lift up your voices in song for our closing hymn. Thank you. 
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. There you go.